this uh, set of slides is about working with a parallel cascade problem using the integral uh, only method, which is often seen in industry. So I'm going to split the slides up into several areas. Firstly, problem definition. Then I'm going to walk you through a typical solution that one would use or one would find or could find. Um, I'm then going to work through the example and show it how it works with various set point changes. And then I'm going to demonstrate what happens when you take a loop out of cascade and you go for saturation. One of the other topics which is not well understood is uh, how you can um, end up with oscillation and how you need to address the tuning based on the number of loops in cascade. And the last one is typical intermediate implementations of manual loaders to improve the bumpless transfer and allow for biased flow or biased cascaded slave loops. So I thought I'd change the uh, operating system for it for this particular video because obviously everyone's seen all of the Emerson ones. And the reason why I want to use the Yokogawa because it's easier to demonstrate this particular problem in one drawing or one control drawing. It's a lot easier to see the whole thing working. So the first thing I need to do is talk you through the problem and uh, exactly what I've, what I've drawn in this particular control drawing. So what I have here is the control drawing for a flow controller that is split over several slave loops. So the best way to draw it, I'm going to try, is you have a, uh, a tank and you're trying to control the level on it. And you have an LIC and you have something like let's say in this particular example we have three outlets and the objective is to split the flow we want another um, master controller we're going to call it an FYC and so the LIC is trying to control the level and the FYC is going to manipulate all three of these um, all three of these flows in parallel. So that's the, the, the problem that we have. So looking at the control drawing, we have we have a FYC, which is shown here as a PID block. This is a typical PID block in the Okubawa. And then we have the three slave loops, which are in parallel, as you can see here. Now, these lag blocks are purely there just to approximate the I.O. from the field. So the output from the PID block, um, the output from the PID block goes in as a PV to this lag block, which is a linear, uh, it's a first order transfer function block. And the output from the block goes back as a PV. So that just approximates the process. That's all we're doing. And we'll get to this block up here shortly. So this is what this is the problem. I'm trying to control a common level or a common pressure or something that's common and I have multiple slaves. I have multiple slaves on which to con to control the level. So one would normally have in this particular case the LIC would be here and its output would be connected to there. And you have three parallel, equally um, balanced flow controllers and outlets. That defines the problem. I'm just going to first talk you through this control drawing, um, what, I'm, what it's, it's shown here. This is a typical approach or a very common approach that is used where the PID block that is at the top here PID block here 
is made an integral only control loop and I'll explain that now and its output is equally distributed to the multiple parallel legs now the PV of this FRC is calculated by the summer block so the PV of this PID block which is a purely integral only controller is if you look very carefully it's the sum of these three set points so it's that set point that set point and that set point and those are the pure it's a pure summing summing block so really if you look at it it's an artificial control loop where all three set points which are the output of the PID block come back in as the PV and this is an integral only so it's a set point to set point comparison so it's the output split out to a total set point summed and set fed back to this FYC block and this is a, a very common approach just to have uh, flow controllers or yeah, multiple flow controllers in parallel. We get to some of the issues around how the balancing is often done on each of these legs. So just quickly having a look at the F out block, which was in the middle. I move this down. That's this block here. It's, you always need to read the in instruction manuals from the DCS or control vendor. And what it does is it says here it distributes the cascade set points signals to multiple downstream controller blocks. This block may be applied in cascade loop control with multiple function blocks in parallel. And then it shows you the set value comes in and it gets split up to outputs. Multiple outputs or eight in this particular case. <coughs> Here's an example of how it's been drawn. It's very similar to what we've shown you in the upstream uh, in the previous in the control drawing what it does um, there's some text here that explains it says considering the range of each of the output destination the set point signals to be distributed undergo a range match in other words what it does is the input for this particular example is 0 to 100 percent comes in 0 to 100 percent and then it looks at the range of the each of the slave loops so in our particular example, we have um, so that this is zero to one hundred percent, and let's assume this one here, this input here, is not to ten, and that input there is not not to one hundred. All that it does on these scaling blocks is if this value coming out here is fifty percent. And it will scale the set point here to 5 and the set point here to 50. This is in essence what it's trying to explain here, if I have it correct as well. Now in terms of bumpless transfer, which is another concept which we have to keep in mind, it talks about bumpless switching here. Um, it says switches the manipulated variable without causing it to change abruptly when the block is being changed, when the manipulated variable has been switched a downstream uh, cascade connection. Now what does that mean? Let's have a look at what it explains there very carefully. The, uh, it needs to push back a signal to the master loop if all of the slave loops are not in cascade so that when the first slave loop is placed in cascade the transfer is bumpless. Now what it does is it explains here very very nicely. Well, it does it in a in a in what a colleague of mine, uh, Jan Kruger, said he, it's Japanese English or Jinglish. So you have to read it very carefully. But in essence, what it's telling you is that, and it's quite important to read it here. Output um, pushback can only be ha uh, handled in one input signal at one time. In other words, the balance when they balance the bumpless transfer of a cascade loop. It's only possible in the first loop. And that is very important to understand. So if all three slave loops are not in cascade, 
only when the first loop is placed into a cascade is the transfer bumpless. The remaining loops will not um, be, uh, the transfer when they go into cascade will not necessarily be bumpless. So it tries to explain here why it can be prevented. But in essence, you can only have a bumpless transfer on the first loop that's placed into cascade. And I'm going to demonstrate it to make so that it makes sense when, when we're done. So here is the control drawing, which is now online. This is how you would see it on the Yokogawa on an online um, condition. All of the slave set points. Now the nice thing, again, the reason why I did it in the Yoko is because I can, I can pull up the face plates very, very quickly. All of these slave loops are in auto, and you can see the mode here, auto, auto, auto. And you can also typically see what the conditions of the signals are. So there's a zero signal, zero signal, and the sum signals are all zeros. So I'm just going to take this particular one to 10 cubes an hour. Now if you look very carefully, because it's been tuned fairly slowly, that set point went to 10. We didn't really see a jump in the output. It's integrating up to 10. So this is the PV. It's coming back here and it's showing you the PV. So you'll see that's the PV. The calculated set point is the sum of the three. Because C comes in here and that value is 10 at the moment. So the value coming on this leg here is 10. Now also what's important to note is that the PV or the set point for this one is also 10. So that's how you've done the SVPV kind of calculation. Now what, what should happen is and I'm pulling up both face plates now. You'll notice that I'm going to put, this is the FYC block. I'm going to put it into auto. So there's the, the required mode, which is auto. There is the actual mode, which is initializing manual. Because the slave loop is not in cascade. In this particular configuration at the moment, which is also something well, not always explained, we do not have SVPV track. So in other words, when I'm in manual or IMAN or not in auto completely, the set point does not track the PV. This is a feature you would sometimes do for uh, level loops. So what I want to do quickly is just fix that. And the way that's done is editing the detail of this control block. There we go, it's under basic. Measurement tracking and manual mode, I'll make it yes. Auto, I'll just make this yes. And then we save it. And then we download it to the controller. And it's as seamless as that. Okay, stay busy. So now we have set point PV tracking. So if I take the set point of the, the slave loop now to 15. You'll see immediately that these two values tracked. That there became the PV for that, and the PV goes to that because we're in IMAN. Because of that. So that's pretty much what is happening. And that, that, that explains how the loops are kind of connected. What I need to also explain to you is what I've done is on this loop here, I've ranged this loop from 0 to 300. As you can see over here, 0 to 300. And each of the slave loops is 0 to 100. At least it makes sense. 1, 2, 3, 300. So you can see 0 to 100 
and I've put a bit more feeling from this in Arab. On the slave loops themselves, one of the other things which I always try and get across is understand the algorithm that's being used. You'll notice that it was quite slow. I mean, it still is quite slow. If I pull up the tuning on that faceplate, it's got proportional band. Yeah, this is a different uh, algorithm, so it's 100 over 150. Critical time is a bit short, a bit long, so I'm going to make that five seconds. Make sure it's the same for the other ones. These lag blocks, which approximate the process, uh, you'll see that the gain is one, and the rise time is two. Unfortunately, the trending is not that great on Yakubawa, but the CPV is the calculated. Uh, PV value and the RV is the remote value. So this is the output from the PID block and that's the calculation. Let's round it off because of uh, one decimal place. So that defines how it's been implemented. We're taking this output from 0 to 100 and it gets rescaled equally 0 to 100 on all three legs. That's why I kept the scaling around it just to not make it too complicated for now. So that's how one would implement. What I wanted to show is on this particular control drawing, if we go into the detail of this particular loop and we go to its control mo control calculation. On the Akagawa, it talks about different modes for a PID control algorithm. Automatic determination type two, which is the default for every single PID block. Um, automatic determination, which uh, is explained in the manuals. These are all explained in the manuals. Proportional PV derivative type PID control. So this is ID-P. That's ID-P. And this is a PI-D. So normally I change it all to these particular this particular setting um, by default. But I'm, that's just something you've got to keep in mind on, the, on this particular system. So returning to this problem, again, um, as you can see, of these three loops, all of them are auto, and only the C block is at 15 cubes. What I'm going to do now is change the B and the A block. Let's go from, so they're slightly imbalanced. Again, you'll immediately see the 45 that comes fed back as the PV. So that's, and then we'll do the A block. So now they're all pretty much the same. A and B are the same and C is different. So we've got 30, 30 and 15. That's giving you 75. Now, what I want to demonstrate is what happens when we put one of the loops into the first loop into cascade. So I'm going to start with the A leg. So first thing I have to actually want to talk to is the um, tuning on the FYC block. Now in the Okugawa, if you look at the help manual, if you put the proportional band to zero, it converts it to an integral only loop. So I put an integral time of one and a half seconds. What I will do for now is I'm going to put it to a default value of three seconds for the three legs, and I will get to that detail shortly. And um, I'm going to reserve this trend so at least we know what's going on with the trend for this FYC block. Although this graphic is not that great, we'll be good enough for now. So what I want to show what happens is when we place the, FYC, the, the first FIC block into cascade. Now remember it's an auto and what we want is bumpless transfer. So it should be, there should be no bump. So I'm going to put it into cascade. It goes into cascade and you'll see it comes out of initializing. Now because we only have one leg which is in cascade, if I 
take the set point up to 80. It can only take the, it can only manipulate the first of the three. So its output has started to increase. And you can see now it's increasing its output and increasing the set point of the A loop. And there you can see. So the cyan line here is the uh, PV, magenta is the OP. You can see its OP went to 30, uh, 35%. Now the OP unfortunately doesn't mean much because of the way things have been done here, but you can see it, it, it happened reasonably quickly. If we drop the integral time down to one second, what I'm going to do is... Uh, yeah, so Dropping it down to one second. We had 80 now, so it's 35. So if we look at the three, it's 35, 13, 15 at 80. I'm going to drop it back down to 75, which is where we started. And again, with the integral time of one second, that's very quick and very smooth. Nice transition. So now we, that's with one leg in, in Cascade. We're going to now put the second leg into Cascade, which is your B leg. So now we have two legs in Cascade. Now it's going to be bumpless because we started at the same point. Uh, we'll go back to what happens with the C leg because we're starting at 15 on that one. Um, again, I'm going to now take a set point up. Let's take it to... 85 because we've got two. Now it's going to manipulate both of these simultaneously, as you can see. Nice and quick. Nice quick response with a one second reset time. Um, and we'll take it back to 75. Control response is nice and quick. Okay, so that's with the two legs, and you can see so it's it splits it equally across the legs in cascade. Now I'm going to put the third leg into cascade. Now obviously we're starting at 15 and not uh, 30, so to actually balance 75 across three, it's going to be it's going to be 25 cubes each. So when I, the minute I put this into cascade, what we will see is that its output's going to jump. Well, it, it will jump, but let's put it into cascade. So the set point is 15, jumps to 30, and then to 25. So you can see that was very I can't unfortunately zoom in there too much. We can, that's as good as it's going to get. So that's with the one second uh, reset time. So it's fairly quick. Um, again, if we take the load allocator and now we take it to 100. Take the load allocator and increase it to 100. It's almost instantaneous. Instantaneously reaches the set point. Okay, so what you saw, the problem we have here is that it's not bumpless. And then the third loop was placed into Cascade. And uh, well that's a bit of an issue. So we have to design around that. We have to add an option in. Because now we might want to bias each one of these relative to the, the total output. So now I just want to demonstrate a few practical issues around this particular um, control design. And um, 
what happens in transition. So we are sitting with the situation where we've lined out at um, steady of 100, 100 cubes each. So the controller has a set point of QV of 100. Our point was 33.3, which got split equally for all three slave loops. Now what happened is the operator then took two of his loops out of cascade put them into auto and he's only operating one of the loops in cascade this can often happen and we want to see what happens if the master loop for some reason demands more than what the slave loops can provide so i'm going to take the set point of this loop to 200. so you'll immediately see that it starts integrating up it's at 100 percent output Already we can see, we can already see that the 100% output is relayed to 100 cubes and that controller is now opening. What we also see is the PV is not reaching set points. So if we had a master slave cascade loop, the master loop would not know that the slave loop is saturated, which is uh, an important aspect, the first important aspect in, in this particular design problem. Now it's reached the uh, steady state. You can see it happen fairly quickly uh, because of the. If you have a look, if you have a look at the response here, it was very very quick. Uh, very very quick. It um, reached saturation. This is here. This the magenta line is the output of the uh, master load allocation. Now we're going to bring it back down to where it was, which was 100. what happens so what you'll see it's slower on the way down if you look very carefully uh, again I'm going to create an app just now just to demonstrate the difference but if you look at this look at this response versus that response the output and the cyan line versus that cyan line you have different responses in different directions because the loop, the master loop, is saturated. That's one of the, that's one of the, the problems that you tend to see is, is your dynamics change depending on the saturation of the master loop. So I'm going to take the master loop again to 200 and let it line out there for a short while. Now it's busy lining out, so I just wanted to show, just show something just for, to make it clear again. The PV here is 98, 33, 33. If you add those up, you do not get 100, you do not get 166.67 because that total there is the sum of the work, of the working set points. So it's 100 plus 33.3 plus 33.3. So that's, I just want to point out that you're not summing the PVs, you're summing the SVs to get the PV of the load allocation. It is now at a steady point, and for now, for some reason, operator decides, oh, well, he sees there's a problem. He or she sees there's a problem. Decides to go to second loop, places the second loop into cascade. And what you need to watch is what happens on this particular arrangement. Zooming in on this, if I pull open the tuning panel for this particular loop, which I had open, you'll see for one scan cycle, or two scan cycles, the, the SV is in full range. Now, you'll notice that this loop is very nice and steady. So the magenta line here is nice first order and that's a nice first order. Again, I need to remind you of the fact that we chose auto determination for all of these control loops. Now this is not exactly what you would see. I'm gonna change them from auto determination to a PI-D. And with these tuning settings, 
and it's a gain of basically um, 100 over 150. We should see an initial kick in the output over here, which we're not seeing. So this, this is an undesirable um, transition. You can also see it on this transition here. The PV jumped um, high and then it came down. So it's not a really bumpless way of transferring. One could argue that this is noise, and um, but in actual fact, in practical terms, this, this, is, this is an issue. What I've done is I've uh, zoomed in now on the A loop or the C leg where we saw a very large kick. And you can see there the output on the cyan line with that initial kick and the transition. And that's what we're expecting to see. So the C leg definitely demonstrates or displays PI-D uh, algorithm on the transition on the slave loop which was only in, um, it was auto and then went cascade. We don't see the sudden kick. That's why the notes from the Yokogawa indicate that although this transition is a bit of a bump, or can cause a bit of a bump, because it goes from auto to cascade, we do not get a, a sudden bump in the set point because of the auto determination. I'm just gonna change it now and just demonstrate what happens when we remove the auto determination. So what I've done here is I've uh, changed all of the all of the loops to type two, which is pi d, and that's pretty much the, the changes that I've made. And what I need to do is just download the changes. So what I've done here is uh, given an example of what happens if I move the set point from manually, and you can see that there's a proportional kick and then the PV moves fairly quickly. It would appear on Yokogawa that, and again, that's why one should read the help file, with a splitter block, it uh, does not have a kick effect on the set point. In other words, at that transition point there, it, the algorithm doesn't behave like we would normally expect as if we saw a set point change. Um, on other DCS systems, you would see a similar response to what we see on the left-hand side there. But in essence, um, you know, this is what you would typically see if you want to. We have this algorithm and the saturation. So we have this this effect over here. That's the first sort of not really a major problem, but it is a, a an, an issue that can arise, especially if you have fast slave loops. And uh, we've set an integral time of one second. This is not a practical number because of uh, reasons I'm going to explain shortly as well. Uh, yeah, this is one, one example of saturation. Now, one of the main reasons why I wanted to work in the YOC system is because we can see everything in one control drive. Now, in the real world, well, in a lot of DCS systems, the you will not see all of these modules in the same drawing. So, each one of these modules, that module there, and that module there might be on different drawings. So all of these modules might be compiled on different drawings. Now what that means is the DCS system will compile each of those blocks and put them and execute them in a sequence that's determined by the CPU. Unless there is a way to specifically tell the system in which sequence to execute the modules. Now in most of the modern DCS editing systems, you will notice that these lines are all s solid. We have two versions. We have got a solid line and we have a dashed line. Now the solid line means that if you look at order of execution and you have a look, this is the order of execution is that is block number one. That's the second block, third block, fourth block, and then potentially that's fifth, sixth, and seventh. Now, the way we can see it is we can actually see on the top left here the sequence that it's executed. So this shows you the sequence in which it executes these blocks in. So this is an ideal system because what it's shown is that it fires the block sequentially. 
goes to ads goes to ads then it does the PID calc and then it splits it out to the stage groups and this groups again now we've had an integral time of one second here and that was fine it was, it was no problem a lot of the reason why there was no problem is actually because the sequence of blocks is uh, an incorrect sequence of results and that luxury isn't on all systems so one second is not not feasible for all systems now to actually demonstrate why this is where this problem comes in or how this problem so let's let's change the sequence of, of the events and I'm going to move the controller the load allocation F by sigma to be the last block now the first thing you'll notice is that this area here is now dashed and what that means is in terms of sequencing this is before and this is our last and it gets fired before that now it seems trivial but now I'm going to download this control module and I'll show you what happens when I set functions so I've restarted the simulation and I'm going to demonstrate what happens if we have a look over here, we have a reset time of one. So that one's that's the main loop, that's your master loop over here. So all three loops, slave loops are in cascade, as you can see there. And I am going to do a fairly significant significant change in the master loop. What you'll see now which is exactly what was I what was expected because of the sequence of the blocks being fired or triggered you have completely oscillatory behavior which is not what you want the maths behind this is fairly simple to show but if you have uh, and I'll pull it up and demonstrate it next to us but in essence at every execution the integral is looking at for a reset time of one and an interval time of one second and we're scanning once every second because of the the feedback loop being calculated before the output loop or before the PID loop you have the sequence of events wrong so you're going to end up in oscillation now the only way to address this is to increase this reset time and general rule of thumb is it should be equivalent to the same number of legs in cascade so we have three legs in cascade the control module is executing once every second uh, and therefore it should be multiples of that one second so for now we have no problem it's stable obviously now we have now created a controller which is just going to be slower we do the set pin change and we want no overshoot on the loops and you'll see there's even overshoot on that if we look if we look in this region over here you'll see there's overshoot so even three seconds is not ideal but let's assume that's good enough for now now the problem can degrade even further so we've put a three second time interval and I'm going to take two of the loops out of cascade but I'm going to bump this first I'm going to move the set pins a little bit so we get a good feel of what it looks like I'm going to move it at 50 at a time because I know we shouldn't get we should get a repeatable response so there's 50 minimal undershoot with a three second reset time all three slave loops are in cascade which is set point fairly quickly one could argue and again we'll take it back to 300 and all I'm showing you is here is that the sequence of, of when you calculate the feedback 
was quite relevant. Um, using integral only, you cannot use a reset time of, there must be a multiple of, of the execution interval of the control module as well as the number of loops, otherwise you're going to get oscillatory behavior. So, if we're happy with that, now I'm going to take the C loop over to auto and do a similar set of functions. First thing that you notice is that the response time has now degraded. So we have a slower uh, rise time, is less, so it's longer. So you have now actually indirectly by dropping off one of the handles changed the feedback dynamic. So you're, if you had a master level controller going to a slave float controller, the actual dynamics of the final elements have changed. So I'll go back to 200 demonstrate you'll also notice the output of the controller um, or the presenter doesn't really um, it's not the same now because we're only working with two two slave loops so you'll see when we're working with three slave loops we had Rested there now because in the two slave loops it doesn't run it integrates off to a different point. So showing the operator this output is also meaningless and it would mean nothing for the panel operator because it, it changes as a function of the number of loops in the cascade. So I can go A C leg and then put the B leg into auto and do exactly the same set functions. We have enough freedom on the A leg still, so I'll take it to 150. Now we only have one leg available. Notice now how significantly, significantly, the feedback response has changed. So your, this is another problem with this integral only method, is that the response of the load allocation, the rise time of the load allocator, is variable as a function of the number of legs in cascade for a constant interval or reset time. So if you want to make this consistent throughout um, all uh, possible combinations, you should adaptively correct the reset time as a function of the number of loops in cascade. So this is quite important. And um, I mean, if you just look at, at this, this particular drawing, we have this is a minute, this time interval is permitted to as a minute. So this rise time is probably in the region of about 20, 15 to 20 seconds. That one's probably about 10. And this one is fairly short. It's three or four. So we've gone up orders of magnitude in terms of rise time, which is an issue. The next problem obviously is function of the step size. These are smaller step sizes. For large step, step changes, you can get oscillatory behavior as well. So this three second guideline actually needs to be increased. It needs to be greater than three seconds. Otherwise, you can get oscillatory behavior. If I drop this to two seconds and put a second loop into cascade, put the B loop back into cascade, Only did we see some undershoot? Well, the set point dropped, which is not good. We have a little bit of overshoot, so it's really, really not at all bunkers transfer. So two things: we need to ad adjust the integral reset time as a function of the slave loops in cascade, and the reset time cannot be one second or cannot be equal to the execution interval of the PID control modules. There needs to be a multiple thereof, potentially. 
ideally greater than the number of loops in the cascade. In the last loop into the cascade, leaving it at two seconds, and we can see what the overshoot will be. And we'll start seeing oscillation again. So three seconds is two is gonna cause oscillations. I will do a set point change now of one to a value of the number two hundred. You can see it's oscillating already. Overshoots, oscillates, and it's a steady state. So this is a very non-ideal way of handling multiple cascades if we need repeatable and consistent behavior of your final elements, which is your flow loops. So in this case, as I demonstrated, it changes as a function of the number of loops in cascade, and you do get this oscillatory behavior if you set the reset time to too long, an interval time too long. So, so I'm just gonna demonstrate what one can do, what we normally do, is to make it a little bit more bumpless, is we'll put a manual, what we call a manual loader station, between the output of the fan out block and the set point of the um, FIC block. A manual loader has a few functions or functionalities. Depends on each system that you use. In the help files, you'll see that it has a drawing here. Um, it shows a master loop, a slave loop, and the intermediate manual loader station. And it talks through how bumpless uh, pushback occurs. What's important to note is page following and what it says here is in order to make sure that you have a bumpless or a version of bumpless, bumpless pushback is to enable bias tracking so going to the control drawing is the best way to demonstrate how this is used so in the control drawing if I edit the detail of this manual loader block You'll see it has a set point from 0 to 100 that you can um, define. You would normally make it the same range as the slave loop. Then in terms of control calculation, there you enable bias tracking. And uh, one other thing you want to enable is output value tracking. In other words, when it's a Nyman or manual, not an auto, it tracks the output. So those are a couple of settings that need to be set to get this to work. It's now downloaded, and you'll see the master FYC block has has a set point of 150, and it's split equally amongst the three, each three of, of the flow controllers. They're all in cascade. Inside the manual loader, which you don't normally, you wouldn't show to the operator typically, is a bias of zero, which is being calculated. Now it'll always remain zero while we're in this mode. I can go in there and change the value manually if I want to, or by a code. But when we take this loop out of cascade and put it into auto, and let's assume now I'm running like this and I want to drop the set point of this loop by five cubes. So I'm gonna go type 45 in there. Now the minute you do that, because you dropped it by five, the five has to be split across the remaining two loops here. So these will go to 52 and a half and 52 and a half. So this FYC out block is 52 and a half, which means the bias inside the HIC block is gonna be minus, well, it's gonna be minus five relative to the original starting point, which was actually 50. Now during the, the first load, we place it back into the cascade. We'll immediately see first execution, it goes to minus seven and a half. So you have this bumpless transfer. It remains at 45, and we don't jump it to 52 and a half as we did previously. Now if you recall previously, if I placed it into cascade, it would have bumped to 52 and a half 
in one shot and you would have seen a, a bump in the flow. That was the change we made initially of the file. So let's put it back into auto, demonstrate it again. Let's take it to 40 this time. There's the bump just from putting it to 40 and the other loops being increased. Reach steady state. Now remember the output of this splitter block here is now 55, which means in the original design, if I place this loop into cascade, it should automatically go to 55. But because of the HRC block, its bias value is automatically calculated before it, it allows the slave loop to go into cascade. So we will not see a bump here as we place it into cascade. And so it's a smooth transition. And then moving the set point up of the master loop, minus 70. We can see that it is split equally across all three of the legs and there's still this bias. So this is sitting at 46.7, 61.1, and there's a, there's a gap between the two. So this is how you can exploit an intermediate manual loader to make sure that the transfer is a lot more bumpless. And to also, you can programmatically add another calculation or another manual loader block here to update the bias of this value. So that's how you would allow the panel operator to adjust one flow relative to the other flow and place it back into cascade without any bumps in, in, the, trans in the transfer. Just to show uh, an equivalent problem uh, if I did it on the other leg now. So I'll take the C leg and I'm going to move it down by to 55 which is about 5 is what we did previously. So we'll see that small bump so let's put it into auto. So put in the C leg now, which has doesn't have that same functionality. Move it to 55. See the little bump we saw previously as it picks up the other two flow loops. Now the output of this loop here is 64 and a half. So the minute I place this into cascade, it's gonna you're gonna see a, a bump. Place it into cascade. So 65. So each set point goes up. We see a, a different response here than we did previously. Previously it was there was no bump over here. Now we see a bump. That's how you use a manual loader to exploit the um, bumpless transfer and allow for an operator to change one flow relative to the other flow without bumping the process.